<laughs> hey, Lars, that's fine. <laughs> we're, we're all just learning. Um, well, I guess it's 11, so we'll give it another minute perhaps to let people join in. Um, so before we get going, um, my name is Rita McGrath. I'm with Columbia Business School. And the topic that we're going to explore is something I'm very intrigued by, which is uh, how we can conceive of organizations where we push um, you know, decision-making rights as close to the edges as possible. So I'm going to encourage you to please ask questions. Um, I've left a chunk of time for people to basically ask me whatever's on your mind, whether it's related to this topic or perhaps something else that I've been working on. Um, it's it's a real pleasure to be here with this uh, major experiment that we're all working on. <laughs> and how do we interact with the virtual uh, community? Um, so let's get started. Uh, my name is Rita McGrath, and one of the uh, ideas that I've become very well associated with is a real shift in how we think about uh, strategy. So strategy, as we know it, the field uh, had its roots in industrial economics and industrial economics makes two assumptions. Uh, the first assumption is that there is such a thing as an industry. And while it's a useful way of characterizing the world for some purposes, um, for others, it really doesn't um, apply because, you know, it makes the assumptions industries exist for one thing. And the second thing is it makes the assumption that the most important competitors you'll face are those who sell things or produce things that are relatively similar to yours. And I would argue both of those assumptions are not necessarily useful in a lot of today's competitive environments. The second big assumption that comes to us from industrial economic is that equilibrium is the norm and that the most important form of competition is price competition, that you have these beautifully elegant, you know, price demand uh, curves that dictate when something will be uh, bought, sold or whatever. And uh, again, I would argue that increasingly what we're seeing in the world is that equilibrium is a pretty unusual state, <laughs> that, that in many, many cases, what we're seeing is disequilibrium or disruption is far more uh, normal. And so what we're seeing is competitive advantages are getting shorter and companies are increasingly competing in what uh, economist William Baumol called an innovation arms race, where you have an innovation that's created, a, a new competitive advantage gets born out of innovation. Then if you find something that demonstrates product market fit, you have a launch process where you ramp it up and you get it into the market. You've got something that's working. This is awesome. Then you have a period, sometimes quite a long period, but sometimes not that long a period of exploitation where you get to enjoy the advantage that you've created. And then we know, you know, the world changes, technology shifts customers get bored, something causes a particular advantage to go into erosion. And the first big point that I would make is most of us as managers, as leaders, are taught to deal very well with the equilibrium part. You know, the copy exactly, run the business, optimize, be efficient, uh, operate with skill. That's not easy to do. I mean, that's hard. I'm not saying it's easy. But we're not really taught about the frameworks for innovation. We're not taught that innovation can actually be a replicable, reproducible process. And we're really not taught about the other end, you know, transformation. We call it change management. And as though change were the weird thing, when when really we know change is actually quite normal and it should be part of the everyday process by which we do business. And if you're in an innovation arms race where competitive advantages rise and fall very quickly, you really have no choice but to engage in the innovation uh, process. And what I would argue is that means we, in many cases, don't have time for classic hierarchical behavior. And, you know, if you think about it, in a stable situation where your goal is to optimize, hierarchies are fantastic, right? It, silos are great. Everybody specializes on their piece of the process and it operates exactly and it optimizes and it's very efficient. And it's sort of Frederick Winslow Taylor's dream of what an organization should be with one best way to do everything. But if you're in a changing situation, that way of thinking can be dangerous because it's slow. Right? In many cases, it doesn't allow you to make decisions and it bakes into uh, st static 
notion of how we're going to operate. And so the, um, uh, the 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 movement I think that we're seeing is away from these bureaucratic hierarchies and much more towards flatter organizations that can operate more nimbly. Some people call it agile, although that word's sort of picked up all kinds of weird meanings. But basically, where you can self-organize uh, in a way that pushes decision-making rights as close to the edges of the organization as possible. And so I've written an HBR article about that that came out earlier this year together with Ram Sharan on the permissionless corporation. And what I'm doing now is really getting more deeply into it because there's a, there's a book in the works on this topic. And when I say permissionless, I don't mean anarchy. What I mean is structures that allow decisions to be made as close to the edges of the organization as possible. So as close to your customer, as close to uh, your ecosystem, as close to the mechanisms of production as you possibly can, and in which innovation is a uh, core part of everybody's task, everybody's job. And so I think that's a really valuable and, uh, and an important uh, idea. So what are some of the principles that we're looking at when we think about permissionless organizations? And I think the first big principle is technology increasingly is able to replace what managers used to do. So coordination, right? Uh, assigning tasks, figuring out how work should be done. Increasingly, what we're seeing is with the right technology and the right information systems, you can actually self-manage, right? You don't, you don't, you, you, you can select tasks yourself. You can figure out where the most critical bottlenecks are and move yourself to that. And in a way, kind of like this conference, right? The law of two feet, you go where you can add the most value or gain the most value. Um, so that that's, I think, one principle. Um, another principle is that, um, and, and we borrow this from software, you know, you know, in software, it's very well known that if you have application programming interfaces or APIs, that means one piece of software can talk to another piece of software without having to kind of rewrite itself to accommodate that. It's, it's like an interface. Well, imagine if you had that for human groups, if if you had uh, something that would allow me to coordinate with you without having to set up another meeting or whatever. And an early version of this is what they do at Salesforce. They have a system there they call the V2 bomb system, which stands for vision, values, uh, methods, obstacles, and metrics. And basically, every single person in the company has one. They're all posted on a corporate intranet. So if I'm working together with you before before I meet with you, I can look up your V2 loan and you can look up mine. And we can see if we are compatible in terms of what we're both trying to achieve. And if we're not, then that makes it visible. And we can have a discussion about how we're going to coordinate. Do Does it mean we need to change our V2 mom? Does it mean we need to shift what we're doing? And so it's almost the human version of an API. And I think we're seeing more companies adopt that, uh, particularly with the push towards remote working. You know, more people are using these things to communicate with their peers how these things uh, go. Another thing that we're seeing, and we're borrowing this very much from the Agile movement, is what Amazon calls single-threaded teams, where a team works on one thing. You know, instead of everybody on the team working on 20 different priorities, and they're not the same priority, and we have to have these huge, long meetings to kind of coordinate activities, and the right skills aren't brought in until too late in the process, and, 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 and the normal way we kind of organize. Instead, a team might work on something completely dedicated to that thing for say two weeks. And each team has all the skills it needs. So it's got, they're on the team or really accessible to it, engineering, um, design, marketing, you know, the, the skills that are needed. They're typically small, sort of six, seven people sized. Um, and work on one with dedication for a period of time. And we know that that's much better than multitasking, than trying to cover a lot of territory uh, all at once. And so we're seeing these, this idea of single threaded teams working on really important priorities exclusively for a short period of time. And you can get to a result much more quickly. Now, at Fidelity Private, um, Personal Investments, for example, they, they found a 75% improvement in their ability to add new features to their website when teams stopped working in this kind of multi-meeting, multitasking, multi-everything mode and really focused on one thing uh, that they could bring all the way through to completion. At uh, GE Appliances, which is a higher company, uh, they've got this concept that they call a build a network, a, a makerspace, where teams can go and work on a product all the way through 
go to market, right? And it's only when it gets to a sufficient amount of scale that GE appliances will take it into the parent company. So that's the idea. You work on something uh, exclusively. We also see the advent of making things that used to have to be designed as complete systems or, you know, bespoke complete systems introduce a principle of modularity. So, for example, at the um, um, battery factory that uh, Tesla is building in Nevada, the normal way you'd build a big factory like that is you'd have the whole thing, right? And it would take you two, three years, and then it would be up to full production, and then you'd start to get some results. What Elon Musk and his team at Tesla did was they said, wait a minute, what's the smallest unit of production we can build? And how do we then ramp up our production by making more of these modules? So you can think of it almost like Lego bricks, right? And Ben Fluberg talks a lot about this in his book, How Big Things Get Done, which is a great example of this principle. Well, if you think about it, if you make things modular, first of all, you're incorporating learning because the second module you'll have learned from the first module, the 50th module you'll have learned from the ones that came before, the 200th module you'll have learned from the ones that came before that. And so you can get to scale and you incorporate now learning curves, you incorporate the, the best practice. When you have to do everything for the very, very first time, we all know human beings, you know, the first time you do anything, <laughs> it's not gonna be as good as the 25th or 30th or 50th time you do it. Uh, so the principle of modularity I think, becomes very important. Um, and, and even when you're doing large scale things, if you can break them into their smallest modules, that really makes a, a big difference. We're also seeing the practice of doing things in parallel rather than sequentially. And I think that's a hugely important design principle. And kind of back to these single threaded teams, um, you might have one team working on you know, the user interface. You might have another team working on the efficiency of the back end. You might have another team working on how the payments get processed. And they're just doing this all together in parallel, which means you're not waiting. Right. You're not doing things in a long sequence like a waterfall method, right, as they used to talk about in software development. You're actually doing things in short parallel activities. And so you can speed the end result because you're now working in parallel. And I think that's a fascinating kind of idea. Like, how do we break it into modules? How do we make it more parallel? Are there ways that we could do this to get to the end result more quickly? Now, this is an interesting point. It might be more expensive in in the short run to do things that way because you're building in um more resources right you're, you're you're using more resources on a particular thing but if it if, if the goal is to get somewhere in a matter of time higher velocity teams can learn more in a shorter period of time even if it would cost a little bit more than it would if you actually knew what the answer was and you had to uh, optimize and as ben fleetberg likes to say he said you know what you want to emphasize is the principle of thinking slowly, engaging your brain, really testing your assumptions. And then when you do decide to take action, uh, act quickly. And this is another kind of paradoxical thing that I'm seeing in these permissionless organizations, which is this deep connection between urgency and patience. So they're very urgent in their actions, right? So we do a lot of experimentation. We act fast. We iterate. We get to quick results. We uh, demonstrate um, a hypothesis or not, you know, we, but we move with, 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 with great urgency. At the same time, there's patience built in. There's slack built into the system so that there's room for learning. You build learning practices at Fidelity Personal Investments. For, um, yeah, personal Investments, for example, they, they take every Tuesday and that whole day one out of every five days at work is dedicated to some kind of learning activity. So that could involve going and visiting customers. It could be formal book learning. It could be uh, studying something that may or may not be relevant to what they're trying to do. But everybody's expected to take a full day every week and, and invest in some kind of learning activity. And I think that's an example of this kind of patience. Uh, at the same time, you're moving very quickly. Um, and then most of these organizations are have a very clear long-term ambition. So at Tesla, just to use that example, um, they have a real ambition about percentage of vehicles on the planet that are electric, you know, that don't rely on fossil fuels. And they see their mission as contributing to that purpose. And it's really quite astonishing when you think about it. It's a 20 year old company that's now actually able to make cars at scale for the masses. You know, they've gone from being a luxury product, which is kind of where they had to start because it was a whole new category, but they've now uh, gotten it to where they can actually mass produce automobiles. It's a remarkable um, achievement. Um, when you think about organizations that are moving at this pace, right? Velocity 
in a fast paced competitive environment is actually a competitive advantage because um, you know when you have a higher velocity organization, you can actually move more quickly than others per unit of time. So you can learn faster than others per unit of time. And if you're in an unequal disequilibrium situation, faster learning wins. So I'll conclude my formal remarks there and see if there are questions, see if people would like to uh, jump in on the conversation. I'm very open to that. I don't see very many questions in the um, uh, question area. So I don't know if somebody would like to jump in. Pick someone at random. Courtney? Anyone like to ask something? Happy to comment, happy to entertain any conversation. Hey, Reed. Hi. Charlie. <laughs> I think I see some questions. I'm sorry? I see some questions that are populating on the right-hand side of your screen in the Q&A section. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't see, see that. that. No, I don't. So if I'll you go to the right, I, I, see I, I see the like Q&A. I just do And a little Q&A. I, when I click on Q&A, there's nothing showing. Hi. Hi. I think it's like, so you're not seeing anything in that queue. Oh, now I see it. Uh, okay, good. Oh, okay. So, um, there what, you go. I'll leave you to it. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, it wasn't there before. Um, what advice would you give to an organization looking to create a permissionless organization? Well, I think the first thing you need to really think through is your um, information systems, because if you're going to rely on technology to replace what managers historically used to do, um, you really need to be very clear on what kinds of metrics people are going to be operating under. And so at Amazon, they have um, a technique that they call investing in mechanisms. So you're not relying on a human being, a flawed human being, to remember that it's Monday and every Monday we do X. You're actually building it into your uh, information systems. And what they do the, there is they, they are very explicit about leading indicators. So I'll give an example from a terrific book that was written about this called uh, Working Backwards by uh, Briar and Carr. And um, they said, well, you know, when Amazon first went from selling books to selling other products, they had a hypothesis that the more product selection was available to the consumer, that the consumer would buy more. And so the first metric they developed was number of product pages. And so, as you can imagine, there was a proliferation of product pages, the effect on sales, zero. Uh, so the next question was, well, wait a minute, what does it matter if there's a project page if nobody clicks on it? So the next metric evolved to be product pages that people clicked on. And then what they learned was people were clicking on pages, but the item would be out of stock. And so the measure evolved again to product pages. People clicked on where the item was in stock. And then they said, but wait a minute, that doesn't give us a competitive advantage. And I remember when they first did this, this was when um, they were very first, um, you know, they were one of the very first retailers to offer fast, free shipping. And they, and then, so the metric evolved again to be product pages. People clicked on where the item was not only in stock, but available for two day delivery, which they felt would give them an advantage. So once you've got that metric, if you're a product unit manager, right? Now, you know, you know what you're driving towards, right? And it can, it can, you can self moderate. You don't need a manager. So I think step one is really get your tech, right? Figure out what metrics you're operating on. And that may require some experimentation. That's where I would start. Um, in permissionless teams that operate well, I'm not sure what the answer, what the question was there. The anxiety leaders might have in letting go and giving permission for frontline decision making. Yeah, that's a huge issue. That's a huge issue because people who benefited from the old system tend to prefer to 
stay in the old system, right? I mean, they got where they got because they were really good at operating in the old way. Um, so I think part of it is giving them um, the ability to interact in the organization design. So giving them a chance to participate in how this thing is created, uh, but also making it clear that, you know, there's a different set of behaviors that are being rewarded now. So at Fidelity, uh, private investments, which is an example I know well, uh, they actually changed their leadership model. They said, you know, we can't have people in these roles who thrive on hierarchy and who love the big corner office and who want all this distance between themselves and the underlings. We need a different kind of manager. And so they started to do heavy duty assessments based on Liz Wiseman's work on multipliers. And people started to realize it was real when they started to put people with these different skill sets into those roles. Um, it's not easy. I mean, the people who benefited from hierarchy are not going to be thrilled about this. And I think that's a reality we all have to confront if we want to move in this direction. At the same time, people that thrive on hierarchy are putting their organizations at a competitive disadvantage. And so, you know, in an, in an innovation arms race, you can't afford to have people like that uh, dominating a lot of the decision making. It's just that's just a reality. And we're seeing it already, you know, I mean, and I work with a lot of companies like in pharma, right, and big manufacturing where they're used to really tall hierarchies and, and the benefit to your career meant you move up some kind of career ladder. Um, and that's really going away. And I think what we're going to see is much more careers operating the way that you make a movie, right? I mean, nobody... Nobody talks about staffing a movie, but you know, level three, row Q, H, band B. I mean, you don't do it that way. You you build your career in systems like that by you know what you've done, what your reputation is, who you know, what you've successfully accomplished, and that represents your career and that represents how you add value. So it's going to be a really different way of organizing a successful career, I believe. Um, so best practices in experimentation. Well, the first thing is you need, first of all, to make time for it. Secondly, you need to make resources for it. And if I ask most companies today a simple question, if someone on your front lines had an idea, how easy would it be for them to do an experiment around that idea? And usually the answer is it would be a nightmare. They'd have to get approval. They'd have to request funds. They'd have to get time. You know, you just, you just block um, the natural human tendency to want to do experimentation because you don't make resources readily available. In the more successful organizations at doing this, so I'll take Adobe as a case in point. At Adobe, they have a system they call the kickbox system, which is a red box. And inside the box are instructions for how to do experiments. There's a candy bar, <laughs> there's a, a Starbucks card because, you know, innovation thrives on caffeine and sugar. Uh, but the most important thing in that box is an envelope with a debit card, which has a thousand dollars on it. And any employee can request one and they can use that thousand dollars to do any kind of experiment they want. They don't need to get permission. Uh, and they can then um, report what they learned to some kind of central database. And you know, the CEO was asking, isn't that kind of a waste of money, giving people, random people a thousand dollars? And he said, well, not really. You know, I think of it as development. I think of it as helping people take ownership of their part of the organization. And moreover, I'm training them, right? I'm training them in the ways of innovation. And we know innovation is a numbers game. If I have a thousand people experimenting with a thousand things, maybe I'll get 20 or 30 ideas that are really, really worth um, exploring further. And they very much have that. There. So I think it's time and resources to experiment and then and then training people. You know, there are good experiments and they're not good experiments. What's a good experiment? Clearly defined hypothesis. You know what you're trying to learn. Uh, you've constructed it in such a way that you get some kind of definitive conclusion. And most of us aren't taught to do that. You know, and, and so I think some training is also necessary if you're going to have experimentation. Um, so question, how do you compare modern product driven organizations versus services type organizations? Well, even products today are taking on more service-like qualities. Um, you know, it, 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 you want to buy a hammer, right? Well, in, in the old days, right, you'd, you'd, you'd look up consumer reports or something and they'd tell you what the best hammer was. Well, today you look up user feedback and, you know, you'll read some review that says, oh, you know, I left it out in the sun and the handle melted and that will influence your decision. So even products today are caught up in these webs of communication. And I think one big shift that I'm seeing is that we're going from these sales funnels, right? It used to be you had leads at the top and then there'd be this process of consideration and da, 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 da. then maybe sales would fall out the bottom and you were done. Well, today everything's an iteration. Um, and so everything's becoming more service-like because classically, 
the way that services uh, were delivered was, you know, you, you had your customer in the middle of your offering. <laughs> and so you could only be as good as the customer doing that thing, right? And so I think it was a very different way of operating than, than classic product sales. But today, everything's getting kind of mushed up together, where even products have more of a service-like um, dimension to them. Uh, so the comment is Tesla does definitely not seem like the permissionless org. Well, this is fascinating to me about Tesla, because on the one hand, you're absolutely right that um, it, it, you know, it must very single-handedly makes a lot of key decisions. But at an operating level, what they've done is they have created these technological systems where everyday workers can opt into working on the task of the day. And they've got very carefully orchestrated metrics, which allow people to self-select. And, and they literally talk about the law of two feet. If you feel you're not learning or you're not adding value to a team, you dip your two feet and you walk somewhere else to a different team. And no matter what your title is, no matter what your specific job obligations are, you go where you feel you can add the most value to the breakthroughs that are needed to take. If you think about it, I mean, the Musk companies employ over 100,000 people. So these are not little tiny startups where Musk's telling everybody what to do. I think what he does is he creates the overall framework, the sense of urgency, the goal, and then kind of lets people figure it out at the operating level. So there's this fascinating tension between you know, dictatorial tendencies right at the top at the leadership level, but the actual operations of learning on the ground, which uh, they emphasize very much. So I think that's very, very interesting. Um, shoot, 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 shoot. So how can you effectively introduce this concept to your senior leadership? <laughs> well, I think um, I, to me, there's gotta be some recognition. There's gotta be some healthy dissatisfaction with the way that we're currently operating, right? And that could be because of competitive pressures. That could be because of external pressures. So your investors or your, um, your other key stakeholders, but there's got to be some sense of constructive dissatisfaction, some reason as to why we're doing, why, why we would concentrate doing this. Then you have to show them what the path is, right? What's the vision for how good it could be? So how do you go from where you are to where you need to be? Uh, and then finally, you know, what are the practices you're going to use to kind of systematically move to this new way of doing things? And I don't recommend doing it as a huge whiz bang, you know, burn the boats change effort, in my opinion almost never works. So at Fidelity PI, as an example, I'll just use that case study, um, Kathy Murphy, who was the president of that group, was looking, and they were, they were successful, they were fine, there was no business problem. But she made a couple of observations. The first was that like, like most money center institutions, they were very product focused. So you're either in you know, fixed income or whatever, you, know, you, you were focused on your product, not your customer. Second, that a lot of fintechs were starting, even, even back in the day, which is about 2017, 2018, when she did this, um, fintechs were starting to not to take over the core business, but to nibble away. Right? And she looked at how they were operating, and she recognized they were much more customer-centric. They were much more driving results from operating customer back rather than product out. And that's what really motivated her to start thinking about delayering you know, giving these small teams. Oh, the second thing that she did, and this is something you can do in your own organizations, she did a study, she did some research. She took one of her groups, and she had about 20,000 people in her division. She took one group, of about 100 people, and she just did an analysis of what they were working on. And what she found was each of those people had somewhere between 10 and 12 top priorities, and they weren't the same top priorities, and they were kind of spread like peanut butter. So you'd take, you know, Monday, you'd spend a half an hour working on priority A, and then two hours working on priority B, and then you'd go to a meeting with somebody about priority C. And if you think about it, there's an awful lot of coordination overhead. And so she ran an experiment. She took a couple of people and she said, okay, all I want you to do is, you know, do this customer journey mapping, and I want you to make it, for example, figure out a way to make it super easy for them to log in and see all of our products at one point. And she said, that's all you're going to work on. And you're going to have engineering and marketing and publicity, whatever skills you need, you're either going to have on your team or really easy access to. And I just want you working on that for two weeks. And what she found, as I mentioned, was this astonishing reduction in the time it took to produce these features of about 75%. And then gradually she converted more and more teams over to it. Then it became the way that they did work. And it kind of was a self-selection process. People that liked working that way stuck around. 
and people that didn't, um, you know, went 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 elsewhere, either in the company or outside the company. So it, it's kind of a gradual process of recognizing that if you don't start to operate this way, and your competitors do, you're going to be at a disadvantage. So I think this brings us pretty close to the end of our time together. Um, for those of you who are interested in me and in my work, um, my website is readamagraph.com. You can find all kinds of resources there. I publish regular newsletters, uh, which you can subscribe to for free. Um, and I'm generally available. Please come uh, check it out. And of course, I publish on Medium on a regular basis. So uh, have a great time, those of you at the rest of the conference. And it's been a pleasure sharing some time with you. Thank you.